But this conference focuses on different issues, namely what is the Bible and how does the Bible come down to us? And among other things, you must be able to refute or reprove those who oppose sound doctrine. What we're going to be doing here today, and we have been doing, I think is very important for the extension of the kingdom. Well, those are my arguments for believing in the Septuagint. Now I want to come to why you shouldn't believe in the Septuagint after all. Now some people, when I say don't use the term Septuagint, say, what am I to call it? The answer is, there is no it. I can't find any debate about the four Gospels. Um, even today, as Christians, we struggle over the meaning of those passages. Because while we are here at this conference, the Supreme Court announced that it will hear a same-sex marriage case in April, and by June it will decide whether the courts are going to force same-sex marriage on every state in the nation or not. The most troublesome most objectionable verse in the entire NIV 2011, to my mind, is 1 Timothy 2.12. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Behold, behold, behold. There are 1,100 beholds in the ESV, and I love them. What we're going to be doing here today, and we have been doing, I think is very important for the extension of the kingdom, but doesn't necessarily seem so. I mean, some of you may get a real kick out of an event like this and, and sort of leave with a spring in your step, but maybe quite a few of you won't. But the thinking through of these things so that we really have a, a grounded faith is important. And... Uh, the importance of knowing that Christianity is uh, based on um, sound thinking, that we as Christians uh, have a sound mind is very important. My topic today is why I don't believe in the Septuagint. Um, and I'm going to be explaining that topic and what exactly the Septuagint is supposed to be and why I don't believe in it. It's a polemic talk. And at the end of the talk, you may not be persuaded that my way of describing things is right, but I hope nevertheless you'll be provoked to think about things. It's a deliberately ambiguous title and we'll see what I mean by it towards the end. Let's start with what is the Septuagint? Well, we, we could go to no better source than this to get what is genuinely going to be perceived as this. So if you search for this word on the web, this is going to be the first description you'll come up with, the Septuagint, and then it gives you the various pronunciations. So um, let's go through them. They are Septuagint and uh, Septuagint. Uh, oh, no, no it's so where you've got the, the little uh, stroke is where the stress syllable is going to be. Uh, and then we've also allowed, uh, I love this fourth one, Septuagint or something. Um, like that's like chew as in chew gum. Um, Septuagint. Um, I wouldn't recommend that for my students. Um, uh, I also would add to the ones that they allow you here, ones that have gint rather than jint at the end, uh, which gives you a true variety, and it's hard to pronounce this word wrong. Uh, so that's, that should be some comfort. From the Latin word Septuaginta, uh, meaning 70, is a translation of the Hebrew Bible and some related texts into Koine Greek. The title, Greek, and then it take, comes with this Greek phrase, hermetophrasis, ton hebdoma conta, which it's just made up because um, although that is an attested phrase, uh, the idea that that is the only way you could describe this entity is uh, not uh, well founded. And its Roman numerals, acronym LXX, refer to the legendary 70 Jewish scholars who completed the translation as early as the second century BCE as the primary Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's also called the Greek Old Testament. The translation is quoted in the New Testament, particularly in the Pauline epistles and also by apostolic fathers and the later Greek church fathers. So there we have the truth. Um, we'll uh, look at another source, the uh, Catholic Encyclopedia, which simply defines the Septuagint as the first translation of the Hebrew Old Testament made popular into popular Greek before the Christian era. 
Now, let's get to some basics. So the word Septuagint comes from the Latin Septuaginta, meaning 70. Of course, put that in Roman numerals, and it will be LXX. Now, I do not know when people first started calling the Septuagint the LXX, E L um, E X E X L X X. You see, um, uh, so, but we do know that about a hundred years ago, the dot after L X X dropped off, and maybe that uh, actually comes into it. So people now sometimes call it the L X X. Um, and, of course, we've already heard about how uh, this story goes back to the letter of Aristius, which talks about 72 or 70 translators working under Ptolemy Philadelphus, who, um, in the early 3rd century BC, wants to collect all of the books he possibly can, all of the books in the world, into his library. So those are some basic orientation. Right, why you should believe in the Septuagint? We need to start with um, the positives before we go to the negatives. Well, uh, for one thing, everyone talks about it as something that's real. And so that would be a very good reason to uh, believe in it, wouldn't it? So we could buy something called NETS, the New English Translation of the Septuagint. And uh, it's something that you might want to have in your library. It's not um, big, and it will give you a translation of the Septuagint. Or you could get a uh, dictionary of it, or you could get an introduction to it, you could get, in fact, this rather impressive um, set of volumes from Göttingen, which are commonly known as the Göttingen Septuagint, which are a critical edition of this entity, which I don't believe in. Um, then we're going to um, talk about um, the way you could get that online. You can actually download uh, it, you, you can uh, have this, and I have a very fine copy of the Septuagint here in my hands, so we'll be talking about that uh, shortly, and of course you can uh, search it and you have it on your Bible software. Of course when you have it on your Bible software, we're going to have to talk about what exactly the it you have is. One of the reasons to believe in the Septuagint would be that it's influenced us and our translations today. So for instance, we're going to find that um, in our Bible translations, generally when we have the Old Testament word for God, Y-H-W-H, which people sometimes say is pronounced Yahweh, which is definitely wrong. Um, and it, it can't be pronounced Yahweh because it would be stressed on the second syllable, where, and it wouldn't be a long R, it would be an A, and it would have to have the H, that's the third letter, actually pronounced. So if you want to do it correctly, and let's remember this is a scholarly reconstruction, it would be Yahweh, Yahweh. But, uh, but let's say that pronunciation didn't actually survive, it's reconstructed by scholars. But the way that word is translated generally and represented in the Old Testament of our English Bibles is large L, small caps, O-R-D. And the history of that goes back to uh, the Septuagint, or is said to go back to the Septuagint. A number of our titles that we have of books, whether it's Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, and so on, are different from the titles that are given for Hebrew books. Generally for um, books uh, in Hebrew, their names are the first word or an early phrase within the book. So for Genesis, you would call it Bereshith because that's the first Hebrew phrase. And of course, in our Bibles today, we, we don't call it Bereshith, we call it uh, Genesis. We also have various phrases that we, I've given you a list of them, um, that you could say have come from the Septuagint. Uh, so uh, th these are important biblical phrases, amen, angel, and so on. Another argument for it, uh, it uh, being real is it's quoted in the New Testament. Um, and here we have a, a figure that has been mentioned already, um, T. Michael Law, who wrote a, a book recently called When God Spoke Greek. And the argument of, of this book um, is that really Christians today have ignored the importance of the Greek Old Testament and how actually the early church used to think m much more highly of the Greek of the Old Testament than they did of the Hebrew. It was only really when you came to Jerome in the fourth century that the Hebrew got the emphasis um, that it now gets. So here are a couple of quotations. He talks about writers of the New Testament used almost exclusively the Greek Septuagint. Or he says, the consensus is now that when he, that's Paul, quotes the Jewish scriptures, he most often, perhaps always, preferred 
the Greek. So just going through the arguments of the book, he says that there are various forms of the Old Testament around in the time of the New Testament. He then says that the shape of books um, uh, and even which book should be in the Old Testament wasn't fixed at the time of the New Testament. Uh, he says that Christians often accepted as authoritative forms of uh, the Old Testament, which are rather different from the ones that we've got now and rather different from the Masoretic text. So uh, people are taking different uh, forms as authoritative. Uh, it's only later that the Hebrew became uh, standard. And then the big change comes along with Jerome, who in his Vulgate says, uh, we're not going to be using that older Latin form of the Old Testament, which was based on the Greek. We need to revise according to the Hebrew. So that's the basic argument of the book. Or as it's put by a much earlier scholar, writing in 1914, so uh, 100 years ago, he says, it may be, uh, at once be said that every part of the New Testament affords evidence of the knowledge of the LXX dot. I don't know how he would pronounce that. Maybe Septuagint, let's say. And that a, a great majority of the passages cited in the Old Testament are in general agreement with the Greek version. It is calculated by one writer, that's a man called Turpy, on the subject, that while the New Testament differs from the Masoretic text in 212 citations, it departs from the Septuagint in 185 by another, that's Grinfield, who endowed a famous set of lectures that take place in Oxford on the Septuagint, so that's another reason to believe in the Septuagint, there's a series of lectures on it, um, that not more than 50 of the citations materially differ from the Septuagint. On either estimate, the Septuagint is the principal source from which the writers of the New Testament derive their Old Testament quotations. Well, another further reason to believe in the Septuagint is that sometimes the writers of the New Testament um, uh, quote forms which seem to agree very strongly with the Septuagint against the Hebrew. I just want to give you uh, a couple of examples of this. So you might want to turn in your Bibles to Acts 15, and we're going to look at verses 14 through to 18. And this is the council in Jerusalem. They're debating what they should do about Gentiles. And there James uh, uh, stands up and he says, um, well, Simeon, that's uh, Peter, has told us how God first acted to take from the nations a people for his name, and with this, uh, the words of the prophets, notice that plural, agree as it's written, and then he continues. Um, After this I'll return, and he's quoting Amos uh, mainly, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, uh, who makes these things known from of old. So a key part of the argument, the scriptural argumentation for including the Gentiles is this quotation from Amos. And what we can see there is it's talking about the Gentiles who are called by God's name. So in other words, that's a very striking thing that people who are not of God's people should be called by his name. But also that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord. What you'll see, I've laid out the Greek text of Acts alongside the Greek text of the Septuagint of Amos 9, 11 to 12. And what you'll find is there, um, I... Um, underlying text which broadly agrees. You may not be able to read that very closely, but you can um, study that. If you get this new English translation of the Septuagint, put it alongside your English uh, Bible, uh, and you'll be able to see the similarities there. Not total uh, agreement, I, I, I must say, but the key point is that the remnant of mankind will seek the Lord. And that's a different phrase from what you'll get in our uh, translations of Amos 9, which will talk about so that they may inherit the, or, 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 uh, the rem- remainder of Edom. Now, the, the word for mankind is, of course, Adam, uh, which you can hear is rather, different, rather similar to the word Edom. And we'll look at um, what's going on there uh, shortly. <clears throat> Another agreement we get is in Psalm 2, verse 9. <clears throat> psalm 2, very famous psalm. And what we have there is it's said by uh, God uh, about his Messiah, you shall break them (coughs) with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So you're familiar with those words. But what you find is that when the book of Revelation is quoting this, 
uh, that what it does is, on a number of occasions, uh, it talks about not you will break them with a rod of iron, but you will rule them or shepherd them with a rod of iron. Rod of iron. So it's saying, Revelation 2:26, he who conquers and he who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority of, over the nations, and he will shepherd them with a rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces. And that uh, agrees with the Septuagint. So the way it agrees is that the word shepherd is in Hebrew letters, resh, ayin, he, and the word for smash in Hebrew letters is resh, ayin, ayin, but the two forms, you will rule them and you will smash them, in consonant form, actually are identical. So uh, our Hebrew text that we read uh, uh, today and from which our English uh, translations are made reads smash, and yet what seems to have come into our New Testaments is you will shepherd in the sense of rule them, uh, and uh, so wouldn't that seem to authenticate the Septuagint? Well, those are my arguments for believing in the Septuagint. Now I want to come to why you shouldn't believe in the Septuagint after all. So let's go into this. Let's start with this name that I've been using. This word Septuagint, we can see actually has evolved over time, uh, both in its form, its syntax, and its meaning. I shouldn't use both before three, should I? Um, <clears throat> so it begins really the story of 72 translators. And I think the form with 72 comes before the form with 70. And they're called 72 translators or 72 elders who are said in the letter of Aristias, um, six from each of the tribes, to be the people who rendered the uh, law into Greek. And that same story is told in a more abbreviated form in Josephus's Antiquities, therefore in the first uh, century. And what's interesting is he, he names the 72, so he very clearly means 72, but at a certain point he just refers to the 70, showing how, in a sense, the 70 are a, an abbreviation of the 72. And uh, what we find is in the early references to these people, it doesn't normally just say the 70. It will actually say the 70 and something else. It will call them the 70 elders or the 70 um, elders or simply the elders. So here we got um, uh, Josephus, we've got Irenaeus in the late second century. Um, Jerome, uh, generally in the fourth century, he talks about the Septuaginta translatoris, Septuaginta interpretes. So he will use um, an extra word to refer to these people. And that's important because it means at that time, they're not just talking and saying the Septuaginta. Of course, there wasn't a word for the in Latin anyway, um, but it's just some, somewhat different. And that habit of adding a word or always keeping a word alongside our word 70 stays really quite late. So here we've got the preface to the King James Version, which sadly doesn't get printed nowadays with modern um, King James Versions. And it all talk about this and says this is the translation of the 70 interpreters. Notice it doesn't just say the 70, it says the 70 interpreters. It will use an extra noun with them commonly so-called. Now, in that phrase, commonly so-called, of course, they are expressing a little bit of distance from this phrase, 70 interpreters. Of course, they do use the phrase, but, you know, they, they recognize it's something not very uh, ideal, which prepared the way for our Savior among the Gentiles by written preaching, as St. John Baptist did among the Jews by vocal as in vocal preaching. So John the Baptist spoke like this, and uh, you have the um, interpretation of the 70 interpreters, translation of the 70 interpreters, which it prepares in a written form. So that's the way they talk about it. Now you can find in between them, um, in before the King James and after the Church Fathers, you can find people dropping the word translators. But you, uh, you will find often Thomas Aquinas doesn't use the word translators, but sometimes he does. Uh, so you will find that there is this sort of habit of, of just a slippage in the name that's happening over a thousand years or more. The other thing that's happening is that that word Septuagint starts becoming singular. Now, the earliest reference that is documented in the Oxford English Dictionary to the word Septuagint as referring to a translation rather than to people is, they say, a 1633. 
Their 1633 example, which I haven't looked up in its original context, just read it in the dictionary, doesn't seem to me necessarily very clear. The 1646 example uh, is um, clearer. Uh, but what we can see is that uh, it uh, doesn't mean uh, quite the same thing. In fact, there's a, there's a habit in the early 17th century of using the word septuagint plural. So remember, it's already a, a plural word, and you put it an extra plural on in English. Um, like our word Bibles, which of course is already, the word Bible is a plural in itself from the Biblia, the books. And when you say Bibles, it's a double plural, right? Like the old word breaches, so I'm going to go to a linguistic lecture here, but breaches is a double plural as well, but you don't need to know about that. So there's a little time in the 17th century when they start using the phrase the Septuagints to refer to the translators themselves. These are people. What we find is when we come to John Owen, this is the sort of phrase he uses. He talks about the, the translation of the LXX dot. Now remember that he's got that dot, and we're not sure, I'm not sure, you may be sure, how he pronounced that. Um, but what's interesting is always in John Owen, they take a plural verb. These are people, uh, and that, that, that phrase is still seen as personal. Uh, come a little bit later, Matthew Henry, half a century later, half of his occurrences that I've searched um, have plural verbs, half of them have singular. Um, so, you know, th there's a, a sort of transition going on there, an evolution, if you like. Um, and the same sort of thing is going on in a whole host of uh, languages uh, that, that, that uh, originate from Europe. So the word Septuaginta is, of course, a plural in, in Latin. But what happens is, if you put that into German, the German definite article in the plural is D. But that's also the feminine singular article. And that A ending of Septuaginta is a beautifully ambiguous bit of morphology that very easily becomes a feminine singular in, uh, Latin, in languages descended from Latin. Uh, and so what we find is that that fra phrase changes its meaning in German, it changes its meaning in English, or changes its, its syntax in English, and the same in uh, French, Spanish, Italian, and so on. It, it's gone from being a plural uh, to being a singular, and um, many more languages besides. And it's not necessary that that's trans that transition has been absolutely completed. There are still remnants in some of these languages today where um, people remember it's actually really strictly a plural word, but largely it's become a singular word. And what's gone on more recently is that people have written books. But what's interesting is that scholarly books on the so-called Septuagint from 100 years ago often did not use the word Septuagint they actually called it something else. So on the hexapla, which is Origen's six-column um, edition of the Bible, when someone produced an edition of that in the middle of the 19th century, um, it was called in Latin the Old Testament in Greek according to the 70 interpreters. Notice it's got that noun still. And so this person who's a scholar who's really aware of the traditional language is not talking about the Septuagint. He's talking about the, Sept the, the 70 interpreters. And, and, and his key phrase is the Old Testament in Greek. That's his headline phrase. Or when Cambridge made their own edition of uh, the Greek Old Testament, this is what they called it. Um, the Old Testament in Greek, according to the text of Codex Vaticana, supplemented from other unsealed manuscripts, with a critical apparatus contained, containing the variants of the chief uh, ancient authorities for the text of the Septuagint. Now, you can see that's somewhat more oblique, isn't it? So we can think that by using the phrase Septuagint, you know, we're, we're making things rather simple. And people don't tend to have titles quite this long nowadays, do they? Um, but what you can say is... Actually, by shortening something, you could be abbreviating to a point of misrepresentation. So that's one change I just want to talk about, and that's just on the syntax and the use of the name Septuagint. And I would want to say that the name Septuagint is quite a recent term, that we can be absolutely sure that the Apostle Paul never said, where is my Septuagint? Or I am going to quote the Septuagint now or as we read in the Septuagint. It was simply syntactically impossible for him to do so. There's no attestation that that phrase could have been around. But let's look now at the extent. 
And what we find is that nowadays, when we get a Septuagint, we might buy one in a shop, we might buy one in Amazon, or we might download it to our computer, what we will find is it has a certain number of books in it, which are rather different from what would have been originally ascribed to the 70 uh, translators. You see, and sometimes people will say, you know, this um, Septuagint, and I've, I've got one of these things in my hand, and what can I get in there? I can get the book of Judith, uh, uh, Tobit, 1 and 2 Maccabees, ooh, 3 and 4 as well. Uh, lovely. And uh, you can see all these, um, the Wisdom of Solomon and so on, and it's, it's all in there. And so people can have this sense. The New Testament writers quote the Septuagint, and the Septuagint has got all of these wonderful books in. Therefore, the New Testament writers are essentially authenticating the whole collection of books. But hang on, this modern definition of a Septuagint as containing this collection of books is a really very recent thing. And we need to look at that a little bit more critically. But even some scholars fall into the trap of thinking that um, the New Testament writers must have had some wider canon. Um, so originally, this story of the 70 translators is very specifically restricted to the law they're writing about the um, law of Moses, of course, the uh, uh, Pentateuch. So what happens is this term grows over time. So in the letter of Aristius, it's just the law. Then we find that by the time we have Josephus um, in the first century, it's still just the law. Then we find next we've got Paul. Hmm. What did Paul think that the 70 translators had translated? The answer is we simply don't know. What we do know is that the first attestation that we have of anyone thinking that the 70 translators had done anything more than the law was in the second century, Justin Martyr, where he is in his dialogue with Trypho the Jew and talking about um, uh, the authenticity of the Old Testament. And in that context, he claims, and he's not very accurate in some of these claims, uh, that uh, the 70 translators is also, and, and these are the specific books he seems to refer to, translated Ezra, Psalms, Isaiah, Isaiah in your language, and Jeremiah. Um, so what you can find is there's a sense of the number of books is growing. We go a little bit later and we find Origen is in a dialogue with Julius Africanus, and they're both very learned people. And at that point, Origen is convinced that the book of Susanna, part of the Apocrypha, um, is also part of the work of the 70. But there's no claim uh, that, that necessarily the book of Tobit or Judith are in that category. And uh, there is a whole research topic to do here about looking and saying, finding out when was a particular book now classified as in the Septuagint, first in the Septuagint. So if you're looking for people, uh, if you're looking for something to research after the biblical period, but from a sort of historical point of view, there's a lot to do. So I, I just looked up um, a 17th century manuscript, Syriac manuscript in the British um, uh, Library, and it will uh, seize the book of Tobit in Syriac, and it, it says this is done according to the work of the 70. Now, of course, it might be that it means that that was a Syriac version of the, of the form of the 70 known as the syro -hexapla. And so it's not really saying this is the work that the 70 did. But, but it, what it isn't claiming in that book is that all of these other works come from uh, the 70. So in other words, you, you have... Um, a thing that we need to investigate, which is when the first time anyone thought that the 70 translators had actually included any of these particular books uh, that we now have. So what we can find is a modern apocrypha has, uh, sorry, a modern Septuagint also has the apocrypha. By the way, the definite article on apocrypha is only 400 years old, and in the time of the King James Version, it was just apocrypha. And that, that's significant because there was no the apocrypha. So that's quite a modern thing. So in our Septuagint today, what will we find? Well, we'll find one of the books uh, known as the Wisdom of uh, Ben Sira or um, Ecclesiasticus. And in the uh, prologue to that, um, the uh, translator says 
the law and the prophets and the other writings have already been translated before his time, and he doesn't seem to see his own work as in any way part of that same work. So in my Septuagint that I might buy, uh, it will just be sitting there alongside, but when I actually read the content of the work, it doesn't seem to include itself um, amongst those things. I will also find a book called The Wisdom of Solomon, which almost certainly was written in Greek. So it didn't need to be translated into Greek by anyone because it was already in Greek. Um, and, and there are other books now that you can find in your Septuagint. And when this is the very de um, you know, deceitful thing about having um, too much information available in Bible software. You see, because basically you've got a tool that is more powerful than sometimes our ability to analyze critically the information that's available in it. So it gives you actually false information because uh, what you can say is I want to know what words were being used around the time of the New Testament or what words were being used in translations and of course you've got a complete um, hodgepodge of things in there. Some of them are works which were translated from Hebrew into Greek and some were things that were actually written in Greek in the first place. Um, and you can also find uh, within your Septuagint um, the Odes uh, which is wonderful, um, uh, yeah, great book, I'd really recommend the Odes, but what you'll find is the Odes are, of course, um, songs that are used in the Greek church and that many of them come from the Old Testament itself. So as I look in my edition of, uh, of the Odes just here, you can see all these uh, songs laid out. I have the, the prayer of Habakkuk. Well, that's really just Habakkuk 3 uh, stuck into my Odes. And I've got the prayer of Isaiah, the prayer of Jonah, that's Jonah 2 stuck into my Odes. Um, but I've also got the Song of the Three Children, which is the song which supposedly um, Shagrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, said when they're in the fiery furnace. And then I go on to the prayer of Mary, Mother of God. Now, hang on, I'm reading the Septuagint, uh, and here I have in it the prayer of Mary, Mother of God, uh, taken, of course, straight from Luke chapter 1, and the prayer of Zechariah. And uh, I can go on and I can have, oh, the prayer of Simeon. Uh, that's Luke chapter 2. You know, now you let your servant depart in peace. And I could read Ode number 14, which is great. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Uh, 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 goodwill amongst men. We praise you, bless you, we worship you, we glorify you, we thank you uh, because of your great glory. Um, Lord King, you who are in heaven, the Lord Almighty, um, God the Father, um, the Lord's Son, the only begotten Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. I am reading from the Septuagint, right? Okay? And you might notice that this seems to be phraseology that's come around after the New Testament. And I had a most amusing uh, experience when um, I was approached by a researcher a number of years ago, uh, who will remain nameless, I've forgotten who it was anyway, uh, in Tindo House, um, who was... Um, puzzled by the fact that he was doing a search on the Septuagint and he, is, uh, he was finding the, this terminology that he thought was Christian um, turning up. And I said, don't worry, it's from the Odes. You know, they, they just do that. Um, so uh, what we find is that nowadays when you get um, a copy, it's got a rather uh, uh, hodgepodge of material and you need to look more critically at that. So we've looked at the name and how that's evolved. We've looked at the extent of the Septuagint and how that has evolved, but also want to look at the singularity and how that has evolved. You see, back at the time of um, the New Testament there, and shortly afterwards, there were many translations into Greek. That's something uh, that uh, Dr. Mead has already mentioned, and I just want to go into a little bit further. So we can just uh, go through the whole of this slide, please. <clears throat> this is, uh, some, these are some modern and ancient categorizations somewhat mixed. But what we find is you could think of the very earliest stage of the Greek translation you have for any particular book. On the whole, it seems that those earlier phases are less literal translations and less close um, to the Hebrew we now have. But we also have, for, for many books, uh, versions that are not quite as old as the oldest, but have been revised a little bit towards um, the Hebrew, but they don't normally get a separate name, they just get relegated to the apparatus um, because they're not se seen to be quite as old. But, but they're actually in the manuscripts and were probably around at the time of the New Testament. 
Then there are some more full-blown revisions. Uh, Now, these um, take the earlier translations, and they try and conform them generally more closely to the Hebrew. So there's one that's called the Proto-Lucianic. Proto means first. Lucianic means uh, pertaining to Lucian. Uh, Lucian was martyred in the year 312, I think, around then. Um, uh, But these versions almost certainly come from the first century or before. So it's called Proto-Lucianic because it's from before uh, Lucian. And those only survive for some of the books, but they are different from the Old Greek. Then we have a uh, revision, which again covers only some of the books of the Old Testament, which is a more literalistic revision. And one of the um, marks that modern scholars have used for describing that is kai ge. Kai means and get means sort of at any rate. And what uh, is so striking about it is that is it's a desire to translate the Hebrew wut and gam and also in a very um, literal way. And sometimes that's also associated with a man called Theodotion. So you've got that as a version. Then in the... Um, uh, second century, you have a hyperliteral translation, and uh, that's uh, by a man called uh, Aquila, and he really wanted to make sure he could get one Greek equivalent for every single uh, Hebrew word, even if he had to massacre Greek to do so. So the way he did that uh, in Genesis 1 verse 1, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But in Hebrew, uh, before heavens and before earth, you have an object marker. And so he wants to get an equivalent of the object marker, but there isn't an object marker in Greek because you use cases to do that. But he, won't, he can't not have a word there. So he actually thinks, well, the object marker looks uh, the same as the Hebrew word for with. So I'm going to take the word with in Greek and I'm going to stick that in. But of course, I'm, it's not going to be followed by the case that Greek normally has Uh, following the word with, which is the dative. It's going to be followed by the accusative. And so what we have is in the beginning, God created with, and then a case that doesn't follow it, the heavens, and with the earth. And it really is, you know, very hard to understand um, in Greek. I mean, if 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 you've read the Hebrew you know what it should be doing, and, and, and the Greek will make sense. But you really have to read the Hebrew first in order to understand the Greek, because the Greek is simply a crib for the Hebrew. It's, it's, it's to help you follow the equivalents. And that's really very close to the, what later is known as the Masoretic Text. There's also a translation around the same time by a man called Symmachus, which is more into fluid Greek. But the fact that it's in fluid Greek, still on a sort of spectrum of how literal things are, it is pretty literal. And these are uh, various translations that we now have names for, but of course there are translations that uh, might have just taken place of one book that uh, people have not given any names to. But what we can say is, if we're trying to summarize that without getting too lost in all of these different names, there is a pattern going on. And that is a pattern of dissatisfaction with the earliest Greek translations. I mean, if everyone was happy with the earliest Greek translations, why would they bother making all of these extra translations? They're bothering making all of these extra translations because they're not happy with what's gone before. And the general tendency of all of these is to try and to conform more to the Hebrew text. So when I look at the evidence, I think, wow, there was a whole lot of translation energy going on trying to translate the Hebrew into the Greek in such a way that gave a lot of priority and authority to the Hebrew. So that's uh, what I would say about the whole plurality of different translations. So which of these translations has the right to be called the uh, Septuagint? Uh, Well, I think during the first century, there were probably several versions of a number of biblical books. Um, And so the question is, which of these might now be called the Septuagint? Remembering the story was originally about 70 translators doing the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch doesn't, in Greek, does not have as much variation as uh, as we find in the other books. But we do find that, at least for Judges, Esther, Daniel, there are two different Greek versions that really become very popular. For Samuel to Kings, there are probably three versions that are really very popular. So the whole question of which of these ones now someone could call the Septuagint is a little bit confusing, and that's not to count lost translations. Of course, it's hard to know how many of those there were. Um, 
um, hard. I'm not saying impossible. Um, what we can say in the New Testament is that there is a tendency sometimes to show um, hints of these uh, revised translations. So here we have in Acts chapter 2, uh, Peter's sermon, and uh, he is quoting from the book of Joel. And uh, he there has in that phrase, and upon my male servants and upon my female servants, and he uses the phrase kai ge, and also, which is one of those phrases we see from the hyperliteral um, uh, translation uh, movement and uh, is different, actually, from what is now called the Septuagint, which only has a chi, an and, not a chi, ge. Fourthly, so we've looked at the name, we've looked at um, the um, extent, and we've looked at the singularity of the Septuagint. I want to look at the whole question of recoverability and circulation. Uh, so what we see here is, it's said, if I, if I get an edition of the Septuagint today, every occurrence, or, or uh, most of the occurrences in the Old Testament of the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, God's uh, special name, are going to be rendered by the Greek word kurios, meaning Lord. However, when I look at Greek manuscripts of um, the Old Testament that come from the Dead Sea Scrolls and from that period, I will find that on the whole, those Greek manuscripts do not use the word kurios, Lord, rendering the Tetragrammaton. Um, uh, one of them uh, from the K4 of Qumran uses Yao uh, as uh, their um, Greek rendering of God's uh, special name. That's probably a, um, an abbreviated uh, form like you get in Yahoo at the end of, 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 of Hebrew names. There is one manuscript, Papyrus Farad 266, which does do that, from, but there's only one from the entire period before the New Testament that actually shows that use of that name. So I'm not saying, it's not necessary to believe that all manuscripts um, of the Greek Old Testament were doing what is now uh, in uh, an edition of the Septuagint today. You can also look at these manuscripts from Qumran and they do have variation from the Greek manuscripts you see later. Now here we have a quotation from a, an older scholar and uh, I think it's very fascinating what he says. There's a considerable weight of evidence in favor of the belief that the evangelists, the gospel writers, employed a recension of the Septuagint, let's say, which came nearer to the text of Codex A, Alexandrinus, than of our oldest ancien B, which is Vaticanus. This point has been made recently in a certain publication. And, um, Dr. Stark shows that the witness uh, of the New Testament almost invariably goes with the codices um, Sinaiticus um, A and F, and Lucian, um, that's proto-Lucian, against the Vatican manuscript, and that its agreement with Codex A is especially close. It may, of course, be argued that the text of these authorities has been influenced by the New Testament, so Codex A has Old Testament and New Testament, so have scribes as they copied, um, allowed one testament to influence the way another one has been done. But the fact has a, that a similar tendency is noticeable in Josephus and to a lesser extent in Philo, so two first century Jewish writers, goes to discount this objection. Now, if I can just unpack that for a moment. What this is saying is that when you look across the, old te the New Testament quotations of the Old as a whole, you will find them coming closest not to what scholars now reconstruct as the earliest form of the Greek, but to something that scholars think as a slightly later form of the Greek, which they now put in the apparatus of their Septuagint. In other words, there's within the New Testament an awareness, I think, that you want to go with the form of the Greek that goes closest to the Hebrew. Now, what about the New Testament quotations I showed you earlier, uh, some of them seeming to agree with the Septuagint? I want to have a look at a couple of these. So let's look back at Acts chapter 15, where we have that rather striking um, agreement between the um, uh, words of James making an important theological argument and uh, the words of the Septuagint today, which you find in an edition. However, when you actually look at the wording, and you can just cast your eyes over it, you'll see there are actually quite a few differences. Clauses are in different orders. It's not that the way James quotes it is... It, well, it, it, there are whole phrases which are very close to the manuscripts we have, which are now said to belong to the Septuagint. Um, but 
it's not that the wording as a whole is uh, absolutely following it. Uh, and I think there are other things going on. So let's uh, just look at the next slide where I've got it in English. So we've got Acts 15 on the left and Amos 9 on the right. So Acts 15 begins, after these things I will return. Now I think that phrase, I will return, closest, most closely follows not Amos, but Jeremiah, where he says that he will return and do something. And let's remember that in the preface to this, James was saying, these things agree with the words of the prophets. It was plural. Uh, whereas Amos simply has, in that day, I will raise up the fallen tent of David. I will raise up the fallen tent of David. Well, that's, that's very close. And we will see lots of similarities. And then we see a very significant similarity so that the remnant of people or mankind may seek. But whereas we've got in Acts 15, seek the Lord, in the Septuagint, we just have seek and not seek the Lord and all the nations on which by name is called. Says the Lord who does these things, that's in both, and then we've got known from eternity in the New Testament, which is not in Amos, but is very much in Isaiah 45. Now, what I think sometimes goes on in the New Testament is that they combine a number of quotations, and here, of course, he's quoting the prophets. So let's uh, just have a look at Amos 9 in a little bit more detail. In the Masoretic text, uh, we have the um, Hebrew uh, Lama'an, so that, Yirashu, that's Y-Y, uh, sorry, R, Sh, W, those are the consonants, they may inherit. Then we have an object marker, uh, and then the remainder of Edom. So they're inheriting um, the remainder of Edom, which is uh, an object. Edom is spelt Aleph, Dalet, um, Wow, um, Mem, or let's say a sort of consonant we don't have in English, D, W, M. James's text, if we put James's text back into Hebrew, we're going to find quite a few differences. Firstly, that the word seek is not Yirashu, but Yidrashu. So you've got a D instead of a Y. Then people can't have a W in like Edom. They're just um, Aleph, uh, Dalit, Mem. And it's got the word Lord in. And you'd need to have the object marker in a different position because you've got a different object. They're seeking the Lord. They're not inheriting Edom. So there are some real differences there. And the differences are sufficient that you can't just say that one of them has occurred accidentally. There's actually something more systematic going on here. So let's uh, then look at the Jeremiah context. Well, this is a fascinating text, Jeremiah 12, where it says, thus says the Lord concerning all my evil neighbors who touch the heritage that I've given my people Israel to inherit. So it's talking about Gentiles, isn't it? I will pluck them up from their land, and I will pluck up the house of Judah from among them. And after I've plucked them up, I will again, that's the I will return, I will again, that's the same phrase, I will again have compassion on them. Well, who's the them he's having compassion on? He's just plucked up a group of bad people, and he's also plucking up his own people. Which one is he having the compassion on? And it's actually not that clear grammatically. And I will bring them again, each to his in heritage and each to his land. And it shall come to pass, if they will diligently learn or um, uh, seek, you might think of it as seeking, uh, the ways of my people, to swear by my name, which is going to be pretty clearly talking about Gentiles learning what God's people should be doing. Uh, and uh, then they learn to swear by my name as the Lord lives. Even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be built up in the midst of my people. But if any nation will not listen, then I will utterly uh, pluck it up and destroy it, declares the Lord. Now, it should be fairly clear that that passage, whether or not it uses the word seek, is about people seeking God and the nations seeking God. Let's have the next slide. This is from Isaiah 45. When it says things known from of old, God says, and it's the closest parallel we have in language in Isaiah 45, that who has declared it of old? So this is what he says. Declare and present your case. Let them take counsel together. 
Who told this long ago? Who declared it of old? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. Well, what is turning to God other than seeking him? So another, and it's an invitation to the Gentiles to seek him. For I am the Lord and there is no other. I, by myself I have sworn. From my mouth it's gone out of my um, out in righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue, I've spelled that wrong, shall swear allegiance. Um, now, you know, and we know that's a, a famous passage. It's going to be important in Philippians 2. And here what we have is a whole group of thoughts coming together. So what I think is going on in the Greek of Amos 9, which people now call the Septuagint, is something exegetical. It's bringing together a number of thoughts in the Old Testament in a way which was very legitimate. So when James is following that same process, he is doing biblical theology, bringing together the fact that there is a whole hope within the Old Testament that the Gentiles are going to come in and be included. Is it that we should translate Psalm 2.9 as you will break them or you will shepherd them? Let's look. Well, in favor of the argument break, we have the parallelism. The, in the poetry, the adjacent line is smash. So break really works well. And the Hebrew root, resh, iron, iron, works really well with the fact that you're using iron. Iron's a great thing for breaking things with. It also works well with the fact that it's a potter's vessel. And potter's vessels are always getting smashed. It's great. But on the other hand, we're in a context which is talking about ruling. In fact, um, uh, uh, there's even talking about um, ruling animals. And rule is often likened to shepherding. And we know that in the Old Testament, there is this image of the shepherd king. And there's an invitation to the kings to be blessed, not just cursed. Because it says, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So the simple idea that the Messianic ruler is just going to smash nations and doing nothing else doesn't really do justice even to the thought of the psalm. So can it be that we have poetry here and that poetry is a form of writing which has really dense meaning and that sometimes you use a word which you want actually to have both forces and that they're both okay I would prefer that as an understanding of what's going on so what would I conclude from all this well I would conclude that um, there were translations of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek before the time of the New Testament. And the early church used these. Some of them were very um, good. Some translations differed significantly from the Hebrew. And there is a whole translation movement trying to move away from that towards the Hebrew. But no one at the time of the New Testament would have understood it as a Septuagint in the modern sense. So, you know, Talking to Paul or anyone else about the Septuagint simply would not have made sense. Also, we can say that Jerome did not mark a change in direction. There were all of these translations trying to go from um, uh, Hebrew to something in Greek and conform more closely. In um, Origen's time, he made a parallel uh, version of the, of the Hebrew and Greek, again trying to create greater conformity. And, and really, Jerome is just part of that same movement. So the desire to get towards Hebrew is not a, an innovation that we um, or the Western church got led astray with in the fourth century and really needs to get back to the first century idea of following the Greek. Actually, uh, it's um, much more continuity that people have been trying to follow the Hebrew from the year dot. So I think a reason to avoid the term Septuagint today um, and it sometimes can be a bit of a pain to avoid the term, um, I, I will admit, is, well, I think there are a number of uh, different reasons and uh, just coming up. One, I think it gives the impression of a single ancient translation. You talk about the Septuagint, it sounds a bit like the NIV or the ESV. So if, if the New Testament writers quote this bit of the Septuagint, that somehow means their approval of anything else, which also comes under the title uh, Septuagint. I think it stops people looking at the actual data, and I think it gives the impression of some fixed authority outside the Hebrew. 
All of those things I find unhelpful. I think sometimes we need to think of quotations of the Septuagint, uh, so-called, in the New Testament as actually part of a wider process of looking at the Old Testament and trying to understand it. Now, some people, when I say, don't use the term Septuagint, say, what am I to call it? The answer is, there is no it. There is no it to call the Septuagint. There is a they or a them. So I do believe that there are pre-Christian translations of the Greek Old Testament. That, I'm afraid that's a bit of a mouthful. Pre-Christian translations of, uh, of the Old Testament into Greek. Um, but I think using that plural is important. And that plural is more in line with historical terminology. Um, I don't think, uh, therefore, uh, we need to say anything more than I mean the title of my talk in more than one sense. Both senses, I do not believe uh, that we should follow the Septuagint or that it exists. Thank you. <laughs>